Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I know I sound like a broken record every opportunity I get a chance to preach here on Sunday mornings, but it is just such an honor and um, such a privilege. And so I'm, I'm glad to be back with you today. And I uh, do just want to say thank you to so many of you uh, who after last week or, or two weeks ago, you reached out to me about my dad and were asking about my family and just seeing how everything's been going. And, uh, and the good news is so far so good. Uh, it's been, yeah, been, um, amen. There's been no complications as of yet, and it's still such a waiting game to see how everything continually works out, but so far, so good. And so uh, we could have bad news today, but we have good news, and so praise the Lord for that. So I'm glad to be back. If you have your Bible, uh, would you open up to 1 Peter chapter 1? 1 Peter chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 1 through 5. I told my wife I was going to be here today when, when preacher let me know, and she said, didn't you want to preach from 1 Peter? And I said, we did that from uh, verses 22 on, and so today we're in the beginning of the letter. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. Uh, if you would, when you get there, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's word? Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you a second to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 1, we're really going to be in verses 3 through 5, but let's go ahead and read 1 through 5 to get the introduction as well. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you, and uh, Lord, we just come together before you. And uh, Father, we thank you for the ability we've already had to sing to you. You are so worthy of every ounce of praise that we could give you. And I thank you for the opportunity to do what the word calls us to do, to lift our voice and our hands to you this morning. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you would just bless this time now. Lord, I pray that you would empty me of me. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would use me to just communicate what your word has already so clearly spoken. When we believe it's true that your word says the grass withers and the flowers fall, but your word endures forever. So your word needs nothing added to it this morning. It needs nothing taken away from it. So Lord, help me just communicate what your word has already spoken. Would I give you praise and glory for the two in the nine o'clock service who've already accepted you this morning. And I thank you for so many who have already been encouraged by your word. And we pray the same blessing over this service now. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. So when I uh, was at Anderson University, that's where I got my undergrad degree at in Christian ministry, about 20 minutes down the road from Clemson University. When I was in my undergrad at Anderson, uh, my favorite class, believe it or not, was the preaching class. I loved my preaching class. I loved my preaching professor. And uh, one thing they taught us there in that class was the importance of introduction. The importance of using an opening illustration or opening story so that when you immediately started talking, you gave the audience and the congregation no choice but to listen to what you had to say. And um, I, I love thinking about that because Peter totally ignores that advice in his letter right here. Like, like he just ignores it. I'm not saying it's bad advice because I kind of just did it right there, right? Uh, but it's just funny how he does it because I, I think back to other letters in the New Testament, like when... Paul is writing to the Romans or the Corinthians or the Philippians. Paul normally has a, a nice warm greeting to start off his letter where he, he typically will say something like, I thank my God in my remembrance for you. Like I'm, I'm thanking God for you, I'm praying for you. And it, it starts off kind of nice, warm and encouraging. But I love what Peter does because Peter at the beginning of this letter rushes past the fancy greetings. He rushes past remembering the people. He moves straight past that and gets to his urgent command because he's commanding the people to praise God. 
He's commanding them to, to bless the God and Father of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's exactly what he says in verse 3. He's, he's well aware of their situations, as we're going to talk about in a second. He's well aware that he's not writing to Christians in the comfiest or coziest settings, but he rushes past all of that and says, I want to urge you before we go any further to praise God. To bless God together. So the question we need to ask is, is, why do we praise God? I mean, if you think about this, this is maybe something you've never really thought through, but every Sunday morning we get here, we spend at least 20 minutes singing, don't we? Spend at least 20, 25 minutes. Why, why do we praise God? One, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible ever is uh, Job 38. Now, I love the book of Job, and I love Job 38. And it's in Job 38 when God answers Job. Job has kind of been questioning God and it's in that chapter that God shows up and begins to question Job and, and essentially what God does is he just shows off how awesome he is Th this is some of the things that we learn about God it, it says in Job 38 verse 6 that God has laid the cornerstones of the earth it says in, in verse 8 that God shuts the doors of the sea and tells the oceans where to stop how cool is that the only reason the Atlantic Ocean is not washed up on us is because God says right there that's where you stop. But verse 12, it says that God tells the sun to get up in the morning. But verse 16, that God takes walks in the recesses of the ocean depths. You and I take walks in parks. God goes to the bottoms of the ocean, right? That's what Job 38 says. I love verse 22. It says that God sees where the hail and snow is stored. But verse 25, that God directs thunderstorms. Verse 31, that God has authority over the stars. Verse 35, maybe my favorite, that God sends lightning bolts on their way and they report back to him, here we are. How cool is that? Just a side note, you know there's 100 lightning bolts that strike the earth every second? One, two, three, 300 lightning bolts and God just sent them every direction. That's what Job 38 says. How cool is that? Job 39, verse 39 says that God feeds the mighty lion, but then it says in verse 41 that he feeds the lowly raven. You come away from chapters like that and you can only draw one conclusion. You and I serve an awesome God, right? I mean, I mean, we serve an amazing, incredible, awesome God. And here's what I want to challenge you with this morning. If that was all God ever did, that would be enough for us to worship him. Like if all God did for you today was just tell the sun to get up, if all God did for you today was tell the sea where to stop. If all God did for you today was in the most recent thunderstorm we had, he didn't say, hey, lightning bolt, their house, right? Like if, if that's all that God has ever done for you, he's worthy of our praise just because he's that stinking awesome, isn't he? He's that incredible. But what I love is what Peter writes here. He says that, that we don't just praise God because he, he's some distant, uh, uh, like off-put being that's just kind of spun the earth into existence and then stepped back and let it go. No, we praise God because God has intervened into our story. Or maybe I should better put it this way. God has, by his grace, allowed us to be a part of his story. That God has graciously allowed that because look at what has, God has done for us. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again. See, we praise God because you and I have been born again. Let me remind you this morning, uh, you cannot take credit for being born. That's as far as I'm going to go. Uh, but I just want to remind you, you, you can't take credit for being born this morning, right? You can't. Same is true physically, but it's also true spiritually, isn't it? I mean, I love Ephesians chapter 2. What does Ephesians chapter 2 say? It says that you and I were dead in our sins. If you and I are spiritually dead, guess what? You and I can't act on our own behalf, can, I? can we? If I'm spiritually dead, then I, I can't help myself. So we needed an outside party to intervene into our life and do what I am unable to do. And the Bible says that according to the grace of God, he looked at dead people and made them alive. Isn't that awesome? And here's what I love the Bible says. We need to make sure we understand this because the Bible says according to his great mercy, not according to yours and mine potential. You with me? Not, not according to like, oh man, they might have something awesome to bring to the table. No, no, no. The Bible says that he has made us alive according to his great mercy. God acts because he's great, not necessarily because you're great. You catch that? 
God acts and God moves because he's great, not because you or I or are great, because it says that according to his great mercy, he's given us this new birth. See, we just need to remind ourselves this morning. And I know if you listen to enough preachers, you'll hear someone say this or use this phrase, but Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Uh, so if you're watching this or you're here this morning or watching it online and you're thinking that this is going to be like seven tips to a better life, like you're at the wrong place. Right? I'm glad you're here. And I think the Bible has principles that make your life and my life better. Amen. Like, I think it does. But is that the point of what Jesus is doing? No, 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 no. He came to make people who were dead, who were far from God, alive. So why do we praise God? Not just because he's some distant, far off God who spun the earth into motion and then sat back. No, we praise God because we've been given a new birth. We've been born again. And here's what I love. You ready? Uh, This new birth has benefits. It has benefits. We've been born again, as Ephesians would say, into the family of God. When you're part of God's family, you got some benefits. And I love how Peter reminds us of these. He reminds us of two benefits. Two benefits that we have of being born again. And the first, the first is that we've been born again to a living hope. We have been born again into a living hope. He says it right there in verse three. It says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I wanna ask a question this morning of of Peter. I I wish that we could bring Peter and sit him in the front row right here and just ask him. I think that'd be pretty cool. But but let's ask Peter the question, Peter, why did you so quickly get us to hope? Like you could have started anywhere. Like like you could have done anything. You could have talked about any theological concept. You could have done any kind of challenge, but so quickly, just three verses in this letter, he gets us to this idea and he reminds the people he's writing to of the hope that they have. Why did Peter run so quickly to hope? If I could make my guess this morning after studying the letter of 1 Peter, I think Peter runs so quickly to hope because the people that he's writing to would have been starving for hope. They would have been starving for hope. Um, are any of our high schoolers in here? Give me a shout if you're in here. Yeah. What's up, people? My people, I love it. Uh, Y'all should see me preach on Wednesday night. I preach way different. I got a hat on and just use slang. It's fun. Um, my high schoolers know, though, we, uh, we walked through 1 Peter last fall and last spring. We uh, started in chapter 1 and just worked our way through it and uh, went through 1 Peter. And what's funny, when you read the letter, and I'd encourage you to read the letter this week. Like, it takes like 20 minutes. It's only five chapters. Re- read through it. And what you're going to see is that Peter talks about suffering a lot. So I know you're like, Justin, you're a high school pastor and you talked about suffering like every week. Yeah, we did. Suffering for doing good. That's what we talked about a ton, right? Because that's what the Bible talked about. See, Peter's writing to people. He's writing to Christians who are not experiencing the coziest of circumstances while following Jesus. He's not writing to people who, who, let's just be honest, let's be real with one another. In Indian Trail, no one's really going to still, maybe there's some people, but still the the majority of our town is not going to really look weird at us for being at church on Sunday morning. I mean, let's just be honest with one another. I know there's some, but but not the majority, right? The the people that Peter's writing to, that's not true of them. These people are receiving persecution for following Jesus. They're following Jesus in their workplace. They're following Jesus in their homes. They're following Jesus in whatever public sphere of life they're in. And life has not necessarily gotten easier, but it's kind of gotten harder. And he's writing to these people, and I got to assume that these people reading this letter, they were starving for hope because they might have even been asking the question, is following Jesus worth it? And I know we're not supposed to ask questions like that on a Sunday morning. I I get that. But they're following Jesus, and there's a good chance that the recipients of this letter had seen friends beaten for their faith. There's a good chance that these people had seen family members lose jobs or lose friends, or maybe even they themselves have come under intense persecution, not for doing evil, but for doing good. And maybe they were beginning to ask the question, is it worth it to keep following Jesus? What hope do we have that this is worth it? And I'm just going to be honest, maybe we're not under the same circumstances, but I think over the last few months, just in talking to high school students and talking to families, it seems like we are in a world right now that's starving for hope, aren't we? 
where so many people just feel hopeless. So many plans were made for 2020. So many goals were set out. And then this pandemic has wrecked so much of it. Or or maybe it's not even pandemic related for you. And there's just events and issues going on in life. And you're tempted to feel hopeless. I love what Peter reminds us of. That we don't have just a normal version of hope. He could have just said, this is what I love. Uh, when, I, when I took uh, classes at Anderson University, I learned this phrase that I teach our high school students a lot because I want our high school students to know how to read the Bible, right? I, I want them to know how to read the word. And there's a phrase that I tell them often. And that phrase is this, choice implies meaning. Choice implies meaning. Here's what I mean by that. Um, I believe the Bible is the word of God, Amen. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit, First, or 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training up in righteousness. Like every word in this book is inspired by God. It does not need us to add anything to it. It does not need us to take anything away from it. It is the word of God. So with that being said, I don't believe there's a word here by accident. You with me? I don't believe it's God was inspiring Peter to write, and then Peter wrote a sentence, and God was like, man, Peter, listen up better. Like, I don't think it went that way, right? And so when we see a word in here, choice implies meaning. That means that there, every word is there on assignment. Every word is there by the inspired hand of God. And I love that Peter did not write this. But Peter did not write, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a hope. I'm so glad he didn't say that. He could have, right? I mean, he could have said that, but Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how does he say it? He says, praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope. See, our hope is better than just a normal version of hope. Our hope is better than any kind of uh, uh, superficial hope that the world can offer. We have a living hope that is rooted in the empty tomb of Jesus. Because what does verse three say? It says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it's a public service announcement for you this morning. Easter is a bigger deal than just one Sunday a year. Like, I I love Easter. Like, Easter is like one of my favorite Sundays ever. I love it. But here's the reality. We're celebrating the resurrection this morning just as much as we are in April. We're celebrating the fact that the tomb is no longer occupied, but Jesus is alive, right? That's what we're celebrating. See, see, this resurrection hope that we have is something that's far bigger than just one Sunday a year. It is something we take every single day of our life. This living hope that we have. See, think about this. If it's a living hope, and our hope is in Jesus who beat death, (laughs) then not even death can touch your hope or my hope. You get that? Not even death can touch the hope that you and I have in Christ. And so here's just what I got to think. Um, should we not as Christians be the most hopeful people on the planet? Sh- sh- should we not be the most hopeful people in our families? Sh- should we not be the most hopeful people in our schools? Should we not be the most hopeful people in our jobs? Should we not be the most hopeful people on our Facebook pages? You laugh because you know it's true. (laughs) Should we not? Because because listen here. If death cannot touch my hope, then economic uncertainty surely cannot touch my hope. If, If death cannot touch my hope, then whatever issue arises tomorrow surely cannot touch my hope. If death can't touch my hope, then a pandemic can't stop my hope. If death can't stop my hope, then no matter who wins in November can steal my hope, right? We have a living hope. That is rooted, is rooted in the empty tomb of Christ. If you don't hear anything else, I'll say Resurrection Sunday is bigger than just one Sunday a year. That it is a reality of every day of our life as a believer. And I got to tell you, too, um, I I think the, the hope that Peter is talking about here is deeper and it's greater than just saying, Jesus, I hope you make my Monday better. He might. He, he really might, but we have to reckon with the people who received this letter. Some of them received this letter, we'll just say on a Sunday, they received this letter on a Sunday, and Monday they were persecuted again for their faith. 
So let's reckon with that for a second. So this hope that he's talking about is so much greater than just Jesus. Will you make my next week better or my tomorrow better? It is a hope that, as Hebrews says, is an anchor for our soul. That even if death comes knocking at our door, man, I have a living hope that just as God did not forsake his son to the grave, God will not forsake me either. It's a living hope. This new birth, we praise God for it, don't we? We praise God for this new birth he's given us, and this new birth into his family has benefits, and the first is that we have a living hope. But the second thing, the the second benefit we get is that we have been born into an inheritance. When you think of an inheritance, what do you think of? I don't know about you, but I think of like a grandparent or great-grandparent that passes on, and what do they do? They they leave you money, right? They, They leave you things. They leave you stuff as an inheritance. I want you to do something with me for a second. Uh, Imagine the craziest inheritance, physical inheritance that you can possibly imagine. I I know for me, my mind goes to uh, Jeff Bezos. Is it Bezos? Bezos, the Amazon guy, right? Uh, Last I looked, he's worth like 150 billion or something. Yeah, billion, not million, billion. Uh, Crazy, crazy amount of money. Can you imagine the inheritance that his kids are going to (laughs) get? I don't even know if he has kids, but for the sake of this illustration, he does, okay? Um, He should have looked that up, uh, but just imagine he does. Can you imagine the inheritance that whoever he leaves that behind to is going to get? I mean, I I can't even begin to fathom how you spend that money. Like, what do you do with that? How many people you can help with that? I mean, that's just an amazing, incredible number to think of, but I got news for you. Even the biggest earthly inheritance that you and I can begin to possibly get our mind around, guess what? That inheritance will one day run out. It will. It might not run out in the next generation. It might not run out in the generation after that or that after that. But but guess what? Even if it doesn't run out in your lifetime, I have yet to see someone be died and buried with a credit card in their casket. I know that's dark, but listen, you ain't taking nothing with you, right? So why, why, here's a, just a thought. Why do we work so hard and put so much effort in stuff that really doesn't matter? Because this inheritance, even the craziest inheritance you can think of, ultimately will run out. But guess what? We have good news, believer. That is not true of the inheritance that you and I have in Christ. It is not true. I love, I love, I love what Peter says. He says we've been born again to an inheritance that is what? Imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. I love how he says our inheritance is imperishable. You know, if you go over to food line after this and you walk down the aisle with all the food, guess what you're going to see on every box of food? An expiration date, right? On every box of food. After this date, it is no longer good, right? Throw it away. It's no longer good. Well, when he says our inheritance is imperishable, there is no expiration date on what God has in store for you. Never ends. When he says that it's undefiled, I I love, I'm not a really big uh, fashion guy. Like, I don't really care enough. Not hating on you men that do. I just don't. I'd rather be comfy than look good, right? Anybody else with me? Like, comfy, yeah, there you go. Comfort over looks, right? Uh, But one thing I do like, I'll admit to you, I love a good pair of white shoes. I, I don't know why. It's weird, but I love a good pair of white shoes, right? I just, I just like it. The problem is the white shoes, if you step in the mud at all, what happens? They're just, they're, They get tainted, right? They get defiled. And even if you try to wipe them as clean as you can, even if you try to scuff them up and do all that stuff, you can still tell they're no longer perfect. And what once looked so clean and unblemished now has some spots and some issues. But with your inheritance and mine in Christ, it is unblemished. Never be tainted. It will never be dented like that. And I love the last one. He says that our inheritance is unfading. And looking into this word a little bit, uh, I was looking at and the original language, the Greek that it's written in, carries with it a lot more weight than just the word unfading. The guy that I was reading who was way smarter than me, studied this way more than I did, he was writing about this and he said that it carries with it the idea of a flower that is beautiful in the springtime and it's amazing and it's beautiful, but what happens with flowers in the summer and fall and winter, the flower that was beautiful in the spring is no longer beautiful in the winter because it's dead, right? But this word unfading has with it the picture of a flower who is just as much beautiful in the spring as it is in the winter. 
just as much beautiful in year one as it is in year 100. It is a beauty that is unfading, and that's how Peter chooses to describe the inheritance that you and I have in Christ. That's awesome, isn't it? Can I tell you what makes this even more awesome? It's like, I don't know about you, just random poll real quick, show of hands. How many of y'all enjoy following Jesus now? Yeah, you can raise your hand. I know we're in church and you're not supposed to say you don't. Like just, like we're, like most of y'all mean it, right? Like, like I like following Jesus now. Like I, I, I'm not saying every day is easy. Like I'm not saying there's never any bad days or rough days. I'm not saying any of that, but I, I enjoy following Jesus now, but look at what he says at the end of verse four, that this inheritance is kept in heaven for you. That means you and I haven't even begun to see all that God has for us in Christ. That's awesome. You see what it says in verse five? He says, uh, who by God's power being guarded for faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You and I have not even begun to experience all that God has for us in Christ. If that'll make us wanna sing, then... I, I don't know. Do we have all that to look forward to in Christ? This amazing inheritance, and I don't know about you, but maybe this is just where my sinful mind goes, is I, I think about something that I get that, that, that's that awesome, an inheritance that's that great, that, that's, it's that mighty, it's that amazing. And the question is, I've lost valuable things before. Right? I remember my parents used to not like to give me valuable stuff when I was young because I was tempted to lose or I was easily losing it, right? I just, I've lost valuable things before. And so I sit there and think, I have this amazing inheritance. Is there any chance I can lose it? Is there any chance it can slip from my grasp? Well, I love that Peter wrote verse five because let's read that slowly. He says, who by God's power, listen, not your power, not your might, <laughs> Not, not your strength, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So when I place my faith in Christ and I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ, cleansed from my sins, and I place my faith in God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, it is then that I am not guarding my inheritance by my own power. I'm not working to not lose what God has graciously given me, but I am being guarded by the power of God. God. Can I remind you this morning, your God's got power. Like he speaks, it says, let there be light, and there's light. Like he speaks, and Red Sea split open, and he makes them walk through on dry ground. Like he speaks, and the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. He speaks, and water flows from rocks. He speaks, and manna falls down from heaven. He speaks, and the sun stands still. Can I keep going? He, he speaks and mouths of lions are shut. He speaks and a widow's oil never runs out. He speaks and when Jesus is on the earth, he speaks and the waves are calmed. The thousands are fed. The blind begin to see. The lame begin to walk. The deaf begin to hear. The dead begin to live. He's got power. He's got power. And so listen to me, we need to rest in that because sometimes I think we feel like we can lose what God has graciously given us. Just me. I, I'm so glad, I'm so glad. You ready? This, is, this just blesses me. I'm so glad that I can lay my head on my pillow tonight and not worry about whether my salvation was altered or changed or affected by how good of a sermon I preached this morning. That is relieving. Some of you, thank you for laughing. Thank you. <laughs> it's relieving. But so many times we think we manage stuff in our own power. We think I'm guarding this by my power. No, no, no. Rest in God's power that's guarding you. I love this. We have reason to praise God. Amen. Because we've been given this new birth into a living hope and this inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. I love when we went through this letter, um, it's so clear in this, in this letter that Peter is not trying to get the people to ignore their circumstances. He's not trying to get them to just ignore the suffering they're experiencing, ignoring the hardship that they're undergoing. He's, he's not trying to get them to ignore that. He talks about it over and over and over. But what I love is instead of trying to get them to ignore the problems that they're having, He's just really telling them to get their eyes up, isn't he? It, it doesn't say ignore it. He says, look up. 
Because, you know, I mean, you know this is true, right? When we get to focus on the stuff going on in this earth and stuff going on in our families and our issues and our only focus is on earthly temporal things, we are so tempted to just be so depressed, aren't we? So, so tempted to feel discouraged, so tempted to, to lose heart. And Peter's writing to these believers saying, I'm not ignoring the junk you're going through. I, I'm not ignoring the persecution and the suffering, but let's stop for a minute and let's get our eyes up and praise God for all he's done for us. You know, I wonder, what changed for Peter? What changed for Peter? You, you say, what do you mean, Justin? Well, I, I remember back in the Gospels, there's the story where Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he asked his disciples this, this simple question. He says, who do you say that I am? The most important question you will ever answer, right? Who do you say that I am? And a disciple speaks up and says, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the, the son of God. It's the first declaration in the gospels of a person acknowledging who Jesus is. Anyone remember what disciple said that? It was, it was Peter, right? It was Peter. And then if you know the story, the, the very next paragraph, Peter goes from a great moment to a terrible moment. Right? And, and Jesus, for the first time in the gospels, begins to start talking about the things that he's going to have to suffer. He says, I'm going to be betrayed. Uh, I'm going to be falsely accused. I, I'm going to be whipped, beaten, mocked. And, and he says, ultimately, I'm going to die. But three days later, I'll rise again. But he says, I am going to suffer a lot. And this loudmouth, boisterous, know-it-all disciple steps up to the Son of God. And with the breath from his lungs, the very breath that the Son of God gave him, right, he starts telling Jesus, Jesus, come on, man. Like, at this time, Jesus was popular, right? I mean, thousands are following Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the thing in town. Everyone loves Jesus. Jesus, you're not going to have to suffer? Are you kidding me? Like, you got crowds following you right now. Jesus, the crowd loves you. You're not going to be handed over, betrayed. Like, Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about, bro. You are not going to have to suffer like that. What disciple said that? It was Peter, Okay. Here's my question. What changed from Peter of the Gospels in that moment where he's looking at Jesus saying, you don't have to suffer? You don't got to suffer for doing good. Jesus, come on, man. Like, suffering's not, you, you don't have to do that. What changed from that moment to when he writes this letter to believers who are suffering and doesn't tell them they're doing it wrong, doesn't tell them to just hit the eject button and get out. He says, suffer well and take hope while you're there. What, what changes between Peter of the Gospels and Peter here where he writes to believers in suffering and tells them to praise God in the midst of it? What changed? You know, what changed is that Peter saw what Jesus said come true, didn't he? I mean, he saw Jesus, the most popular man that the earth had ever seen, healing blind people, making lame people walk, dead people live, all that stuff. He sees Jesus betrayed. He, he sees Jesus handed over. He sees Jesus undergo false accusations and be sentenced to death. And we don't know how much he physically saw with his own eyes, because if you know, Peter denied Jesus three times and, and ran away weeping. But we know that he'd seen crucifixions before. And we know that he heard from the accounts of people who were there that Jesus was beaten unrecognizably. That Jesus would have been whipped with a cat of nine tails. That Jesus would have been spat upon and mocked. That Jesus would have had to take his cross and, and carry his cross to Calvary, to Golgotha. That Jesus would have had his arms stretched on the cross with Nails in his feet and nails in his wrist. Peter would have known that Jesus suffered immensely. And might I remind you this morning, that was for you. That was for you. That if you're here and you think no one loves you or you're not worthy or you don't have purpose, the Son of God did that for you. And Peter saw his Savior suffer immensely, but what changed from the Gospels to, to now? This church family, just as Peter saw a cross, Peter saw an empty tomb. J just as Peter saw a crucifixion, 
he saw a resurrection. That just as Peter saw his Savior and his Lord suffer immensely, he saw him triumph victoriously. And Peter, after seeing that God did not abandon Jesus to the grave, that, that Jesus' suffering was worth it, that suffering for doing good for Jesus was not left to a grave, but that God raised him from the dead. Once Peter saw that following God's plan was, was worth it. He can write to these believers and say, I know you're suffering and I know it's hard and I know it's difficult, but, but I saw Jesus suffer. I saw Jesus spread his arms and die on a tree, but his story did not end in suffering. It ended in resurrection. So the same is true for you. So wherever you are, praise God. Praise God. In the midst of your hurt, praise him. In the midst of your difficulty, praise him. In the midst of your bad weeks, praise him. In the midst of your great weeks, praise him. In the midst of your good mornings, praise him. In the midst of your bad evenings, praise him wherever you are. <laughs> praise God. Praise him. Because Peter knows good and well these people are suffering. He knows good and well they're struggling. But he also knows they've been born again that they've been born to a living hope that even death can't touch, that they've been born into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for them. And so Peter says, I'm not ignoring your trouble. I'm just telling you to get your eyes up and praise the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you, I, I don't know how many issues we have in this room or watching online. I, man, it, 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 it troubles my heart a little to think if we could just lay everyone's issue and everyone's struggle on the altar, I think we would be overwhelmed by how many issues are going on in this room right here. And I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're going through. But, but what I do know is that if you are in Christ, you have been born again. That despite your circumstance, despite your issue, if you are in Christ, you've been given this new birth into a living hope. That even death can't touch your hope. I don't know what you're going through. It might be hard. It might be the hardest moments of your life. But what I do know is if you're in Christ and you have an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So my challenge to you, my challenge to myself is the same that I believe Peter's is to these churches and these Christians spread out. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Because we've been given a new birth into a living hope and into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. So let's praise him. Praise God. Amen. 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 Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me as we go before the Lord? Lord, we love you and Lord, we love your word this morning. God, I thank you. God, I thank you that according to your great mercy, you acted on our behalf. God, not, not because of my potential, not because of my ability, not according to your great mercy. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you that by your grace, we've been born again. You didn't come to make bad people good. The gospel certainly does that, but it, most importantly, makes dead people alive. And I thank you for giving us new life in Christ. I thank you for the living hope that we've been born into that not even death can touch our hope. Lord, may we be in this room the most hopeful people on the planet. May, may people notice in our work. May people notice in our families. May people notice in, on social media and everywhere else. Where, may people notice that we are just hopeful people because we have a living hope through the resurrection of Christ. Or may we be reminded that we have been born again into an inheritance that's imperishable, that's undefiled, that's unfading. May we fix our eyes on the fact that we've not even begun to see all that you have for your children and oh, what an incredible thought that is. Where we don't ignore the difficulties, we just look above them to fix our eyes on you. May we praise you in the midst of any circumstance we have. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask, just so I can, just so I can pray for you. I asked this in the first service, and it was too many hands to count. I just want to know to pray with you and, and 
pray for you, but how many of you would say, Justin, I, the last few months, maybe it's COVID-19 related, maybe it's not at all, maybe it's just issues and struggles of life, but you said, Justin, I, I needed to be reminded this morning of the hope that I have in Christ. I needed to be reminded that, that I'm not hopeless, that I have a living hope. If that's you, would you raise your hand? If that's you. Amen, I see you, I see you. Believer, I wanna encourage you. I think sometimes we can be tempted to, to think we're the only one going through stuff and dealing with things and people around you just raise their hands with you. Yeah, we're in this together. Oh, and I pray that all of us, but you especially raise your hand, that you fix your eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith and the hope that we have in Christ and the inheritance that we have as well. But I don't want to let the morning pass. This morning at nine o'clock, we had two young, two young kids give their life to the Lord. And, and maybe there's some of you today, you're hearing me talking about this hope and you will say, Justin, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I hear it and I'm understanding it, but I've never been born again. I, I don't have this hope, this certainty that you're talking about. And maybe today, is the day that you turn from your sin and you begin to place your faith and trust in Christ. You can experience that new birth before you even walk out of the door. You say, Justin, I don't have that hope, but today is the day I wanna place my faith and trust in Christ. If that's you, with no one looking around, if that's you, would you just raise your hand so I can see you? Wave, wave me down if you have to. Say, Justin, I wanna place my faith and trust in Christ today for the first time. If, that, I mean, if, if that's you, or if you're online, comment online so our pastor on staff can talk with you, but if that's you, I'd love to talk with you down here front this morning. Well, we love you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that we have and the inheritance that we have to look forward to. May we praise you in every circumstance of our life. In your name we pray. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.